Hello again. Chapter 13, Mama Patley's Cave. Suddenly, I am startled by a deep roar coming from my right. I jump and move closer to Sidoni. Whatever it was, it didn't sound like it was too far away, and I'm not in any rush to find out. I don't know much about jungle creatures, but I'm pretty sure the kind of cats that live in habitats such as this one are not the cute, fluffy kind that sit on your lap while you watch the telly. It's probably just a jaguar. There are quite a few of them in these jungles, says Sidoni calmly, once again, knowing exactly what I'm thinking. Well, I'm glad you're so calm, I say shakily. How long did you say our lift was going to be? Ah, right now, it seems, she replies. Right on time. I turn to see a rusty old truck bumping and jolting its way up the dirt track. I think the truck was probably green when it was new, but it's so old and rusty it's hard to tell for sure. The windscreen is cracked and there are two seats up front, one for the driver, one for the passenger. The back is open and there are two bench seats along either side. The truck skids to a halt in front of us and the driver climbs out of the truck. He is wearing flowing white robes and he is a huge hulk of a man. He has a long beard and what appears to be a tooth on a chain around his neck. Around his middle is a belt of coloured rope and tucked into the belt a huge scabbard shaped dagger. He seems strangely familiar, but why? I can't quite put my finger on it, but then never mind. No time to ponder now. It seems we have a volcano to climb. Hassan? Sidoni nods in the fearsome giant's direction. The man nods in return, but does not speak. Hassan? Hassan? Still strangely familiar, but why? I just cannot remember. Hassan walks to the back of the truck, unbolting the rear flap. He nods his head silently towards the opened vehicle. I follow the direction of his eyes. What the... Oh, my life. There, tethered in the back of the battered old truck, is a goat. An enormous billy goat. A billy goat with huge curled horns and a pair of menacing yellow eyes. I take a step back. You are not seriously expecting me to sit in the back of this, this death trap with Billy Goat Gruff over there, are you? I yell, horrified. With one swift move, I feel myself being grabbed under my arms and plonked roughly on the bench seat in the back of the truck. Ah, what the? I shriek as I realise that Man Mountain himself has just grabbed me and dumped me in the back of this pile of junk he calls a truck. Well, if he ever spoke, he would call it a truck. Sidoni laughs. Oh, Hassan, you are a cheeky old thing. Don't worry, Molly, you'll be quite safe. Nigel's a poppet when you get to know him. I am by now literally speechless. First of all, I would not describe Hassan as a cheeky old thing. The man looks like a cross between a grizzly bear and a yeti, only with slightly less personality. And secondly, as for Nigel, who I'm presuming is the goat, he is looking at me with an evil glint in his eye and what looks suspiciously like a sly grin. He certainly does not look like a poppet. Before I have time to protest any further, Sidoni and Hassan have bolted the back flap of the truck and made their way to the front seat, which are now looking as comfy as my armchair at home compared to the splintered old wooden bench seat I'm going to have to sit on. I sit at the far end of the bench, as close to the back of the truck as I can, without falling out, and as far away from Nigel as I can possibly get. Without warning, the truck speeds off, leaving a trail of dust in its wake. I haven't got myself quite seated properly before we took off at lightning speed and I tumble to the floor of the truck. I cling fiercely to the sides, attempting desperately to pull myself back up onto the seat and try not to be thrown clean out the back of the speeding vehicle. If I didn't know better, I would swear that blooming goat is laughing at me. Once I've managed to pull myself back onto the bench, I hold onto the sides of the truck for dear life whilst keeping a careful eye on Nigel, who is pulling on his tether with his head down in my direction. I am absolutely not a goat expert, but I do know that when a goat with enormous horns stands facing you with his head bowed, he is probably about to try and charge at speed in your direction. Something which I do know does not normally end well for the person in question. The truck lurches, bumps, jolts and jumps its way up the unmade road. The road is clearly not used by lots of traffic as it's, as it's full of potholes and rocks that have tumbled from the surrounding hills and mountains. Whenever I do tear my eyes away from Nigel to look at the view around me, I'm terrified to discover that on one side of me there is a mountain stretching high up into the clouds and on the other side there is nothing except a long, long drop to the valley below. The road is narrow and full of twists and turns, but that doesn't seem to be making Hassan drive any more slowly or carefully. I'm too scared to look around me and too scared to close my eyes in case Nigel decides to make a bolt in my direction. 
The weather is getting hotter and stickier by the minute. The dust from the road is stinging my eyes and my throat is dry and sore. I'd absolutely love a nice cold can of Coke right now, although the way this truck is bumping around, I'm not sure it would stay in my tummy for too long. It seems our journey is taking forever. And I'm beginning to wonder why I can't just have an ordinary granny who sits by the fire knitting jump jumpers and weird bobble hats that all your mates laugh at when you wear them. Just as I think we will never stop, the truck skids to a halt at a boulder in the road. The road seems to have literally just come to an end. I squash myself closer to the back door flap and hope that Hassan and Sidoni will be round to let me out as soon as Nigel has just started to try and chew his way through the already frayed rope that is holding him still. The two front doors slam shut and sure enough Hassan and Sidoni appear at the back of the truck. Hassan unbolts the flap and, before I can protest, grabs me under the arms once more, planting me flirt firmly on the steep mountain road. Thanks Hassan, says Sidoni. We'll be okay, okay from here. Okay from here? Is she mad? How can we possibly be okay? We are halfway up a dormant volcano in the middle of nowhere, in the company of a curly horned goat called Nigel and a tall hairy bloke who never speaks. How can we possibly be okay? Wait a minute. Really tall man. I mean, really tall man. Long white flowing robes, hairy face like a bear's bottom, tooth on a chain around his neck, he never speaks, called Hassan. That's it. Hassan the Horrible. I knew he was familiar. Wasn't he the man who guarded the Tower of Prince What's-His-Name? The one who drank lemonade from a fountain and had his jewels stolen? Of course, but what in heaven's name is he doing here? While my mind is whirring with all this new information, I've forgotten about our predicament. Come on, Molly, no time for daydreaming. We need to get going. I hear Sidoni's voice beside me, and it's just rumours, you know. Hassan the Horrible, I mean. How does she do that? Freaky or what? Sidoni starts to make her way up the mountainside, seeming to go across the mountain, thankfully away from the long drop on the other side. As she walks, I hurry away, along behind her, stumbling to try and keep up. The terrain becomes more forest-like and the undergrowth becomes denser as we make our way along the disappearing path. As we walk, I can feel myself being bitten by mosquitoes and sweat is trickling down my back. Never moan at my mum for making me take a shower again. I must smell and look seriously awful. Eventually, we come to a large opening in the side of the mountain and Sidoni moves towards it. She has to stoop to walk through the entrance to what looks like a kind of cave. I follow nervously along behind her. It's dark inside the cave, but at least it's cool and I'm really pleased to get out of the heat. As we walk into the cave, my eyes take time to adjust to the darkness. I can hear strange tinkling and chiming noises around me and I can just make out long objects of various shapes and sizes hanging from the roof of the cave. Some of the objects look like bells on long strings, while some look like dream catchers decorated with feathers and shells. There are chimes too, making a soft eerie sound in the half light of the cool cave. As we move deeper inside, we enter a room not much bigger than my bedroom at home. Candles of all shapes and sizes flicker and flame, their amber light casting dancing shadows on the dark stone walls. In the far corner of the room, a woman sits on a chair of glittering gold. Beside her is a fire and hanging above the fire a large round pot. Smoke from the pot curls upwards, although the smoke is every colour of the rainbow. First deep violet, then bright turquoise blue, before rich blood red. Every so often, the woman reaches into a chest beside her and throws something onto the fire, upon which sparks and bursts of silver stars shoot up from the embers. The smoke seems to be curling upwards and into the woman's hands, and it is then that I see she is weaving. She is weaving a blanket with a huge needle, threaded by the coloured smoke from the fire. I'm so mesmerised by the swirling, multicoloured smoke that I cannot draw my eyes away. Mama Patley, whispers Sidoni, lowering her head in a respectful bow. I do not know who this mysterious woman is, but I can feel that great magic exists within these strange walls, and I am at once both excited and nervous of this strange mystical atmosphere. Mama Patley looks up from her weaving and nods in our direction. She smiles a beautiful, gentle smile, and her eyes shine in the flickering light. Tiena el anilo, the lady says softly. I look at Sidoni. What did she say? I ask. She says the ring, Sidoni answers. She asks if you have the ring. I frown, not sure what she means. The lady speaks again. 
el anillo, el anillo verde esmeralda. Her voice is soft, barely a whisper, and I'm mesmerised by her gentle but intense gaze. The ring, the emerald green ring, Sidoni repeats in English beside me. I'm totally unable to draw my eyes away from the hypnotic lady before me. Somehow, in a trance, I instinctively know what she means, and, as if by its own accord, my hand reaches into my pocket, where I remove the large emerald green ring given to me by Dimitri in the strange little shop at the back of the flea market. I hold the ring out in front of Mama Patley. Smoke from the fire curls up and around the ring. The stone of the ring lifts up, and a honey-coloured liquid pours from the swirling smoke, which is now the colour of bluebells. The liquid continues to pour into the well that once held the emerald stone, until I'm sure it must overflow. Suddenly, the stone snaps shut back into the gold casing, and the ring feels suddenly warm to my touch. I place it into my pocket, and Mama Patley smiles at me once more. Beside me, I can feel Sidoni take my hand and lead me from the cave. But I cannot take my eyes from Mama Patley until she has gone from my view. And chapter 14 next time will be Jungle Trekking. See you soon.